So we're just going to read a little scripture this morning, but I'm just going to pray first before we do so. So, Father, we just thank you for your word and for speaking for it to us. And um, we just ask for open hearts this morning to hear what you want to speak to us and that we would be vulnerable to um, your leading and um, that we would be encouraged and uplifted and maybe challenged this morning to um, seek you and um, follow you more. In your name, amen. So this morning we're reading from Luke 13, 6 to 9. Then he, Jesus, told this parable. Luke 13, 6 to 9. <laughs> then <laughs> he, Jesus, told this parable. <laughs> A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he, and he went to look for fruit, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who, who took care of his vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Is that it? That, that's where the story ends? That, is that the end of the parable? Kind of, kind of feels like there should be, and then afterwards. Huh. Weird. Or is it? <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I know it seems weird. Somebody said that was like a week ago. But for me, first time I get to say it to some of you. Happy New Year. My, uh, my, my niece, Elena, uh, just went back. She's on mission in Italy. But she shared with me this story. Uh, before she left, about a, a 79-year-old little old lady that she met uh, in Italy who, who was about to get married for the fourth time. Uh, each of her previous husbands had, had actually passed away from natural causes. Uh, Elena, who, uh, who, who is single... Uh, asked her about the man that she was marrying and, and turns out it was a, a lovely man who, who worked in the vi village as a, a funeral director. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> Awkward. They talked a little bit more and, and Elena asked her about her life and, and, and the lady told uh, her about a, a few of her husbands. She said, uh, my first husband was a banker. We were very rich. Uh, my second husband was a musician. And I just, my heart melted whenever he was up on stage. It was beautiful. Uh, and she said, the third person that I married was a pastor. And he was so kind. And he was so good. And he was so loving to me. And now, now I marry a mortician. <laughs> Elena uh, asked her, you know, why did you marry each one? Like, how did you decide which one was which one? Why did you pick them? And the little old lady looked at her and said, one for the money. <laughs> a two for the show. A three to get her ready, <laughs> and a four to go. <laughs> Don't step on my blue suede shoes. <laughs> One time, uh, a buddy of mine was having trouble keeping a job. And so his best friend actually got him a job at uh, working at Canadian Tire. And this guy was a bit of a goofball. Uh, he loved having fun, but work was, well, 
work, and that wasn't fun. Um, work usually got in the way of fun, this guy found out. Uh, he wasn't a bad employee. He, he was just, he, he, he was just you know, easily distracted by the things of, that he wanted to do. Um, uh, but he wasn't really giving it his full effort. And uh, especially, you know, seemed to be always looking like he was working, <laughs> but not really doing anything. Anybody ever met somebody like that before? Um, now, this guy could tell that the manager wasn't happy. And at the end of their three-month probationary period, the, uh, things had gotten so bad that the, the manager pulled him aside, um, where Buddy was sure he was going to be invited into employment elsewhere. Um, instead, the, the boss said, he looked him in the eye, and he said, your effort here just is not good enough. Um, and so... It, it, it can't continue like this. Uh, we're going to give you a 30-day warning, and then if things don't change, uh, we're going to have to let you go. And then he looked him even deeper into the eyes and said, you need to turn things around. I think anyone would agree the boss was being you know, more than fair, uh, there sometimes comes a moment when, when it needs to be said that second chances can't continue forever. Ultimately, there must come a day of reckoning. And, and you probably figured out I was that goofy kid. <laughs> and the 30-day timeline that I was given was enough to make me realize that it was actually time to turn things around. To, to grow up, to work like what it is that I did actually mattered. Jesus talked about this in Luke 13, as we read earlier, about the need to change direction and go the right way before it's too late. Figs are kind of a weird fruit, especially for us Canadians. Uh, it, it, it's kind of weird. Uh, we don't see them a lot here. Um, because figs don't actually ripen when they're taken off the tree. Uh, they must be picked when ripe. And, and so we don't see them much here because oftentimes they rot on their way to coming to Canada. Um, and, and so we don't actually get fresh figs here. And so most of us can't go, oh, geez, I just, I'm craving a fig. <laughs> we, don't, we don't say that, right? But... How many of you know that when you're reading the Bible, cultural context is important? Anybody? Some of you. That's cool. It's really important. See, the Israelites and the Pharisees, when they heard Jesus tell this story, they would have understood what it was that Jesus was actually talking about. Figs were symbolic of Israel. Figs were symbolic of Israel itself. It, it symbolized the health of a nation, both physically and spiritually. The, the prophet Hosea, when speaking for God, said, When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. I excited. And then later in the Bible, it tells us of this glorious time in 1 Kings 4, where Judah and Israel, they lived in safety. Every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. See, it was considered a sign of success, uh, of, of like reaching the penultimate if you could literally be sitting under the shade, enjoying literally the fruit of your labor. But later, in the times of the prophets Joel, Habakkuk, and Haggai, they each individually record times when Israel would turn away from obedience. 
from loving God and loving others. They just stopped doing what it is that the mission they were called to do. And as a result of that, it talks about how the figs would be stripped bare and fruitless in those seasons. It's almost as if a multiplying fig was something of a barometer of the health of an individual, of a community, of a nation as a whole. That's the cultural context. How many of you know that historical context is also important? Okay, maybe. Some of you, not so much. All right, it's all good. Anyways, the three years that he's talking about here in today's parable, parable if, we, if we actually have a chance to step back historically and look at it here, represent the three years that Jesus and John the Baptist ministered while they were on earth. Where they were looking for fruit from the people of Israel. And they, they preached repentance to the people of Israel. Turn it around. Make a difference. Uh, you need to go the other way. You're headed down a path that isn't the path for you. Please stop. But the Jewish people, many of them were just kind of offended by the idea that they might need to repent, that they might need to change. Even though Jesus told them the axe is ready at the base of the tree, please change. They're kind of like, nah, kind of like what we got going here. Jesus is like, please, the time is running short. Nah, I'm fine. So what does it mean for us then, if that's the historical context, the cultural context, what does it mean for us in 2024? As I mentioned, in the context in which Jesus spoke, he was talking about Israel, but it doesn't mean that he was talking exclusively about Israel. I believe that he has something for us in this here today. Jesus is talking to us as individuals. Will you turn to somebody beside you and say, this parable is for you this morning? Can we go back to the reading again? Let's read it one more time. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the caretaker replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. I, I really believe this parable is a call especially for the people who call Connect Church home, to evaluate our lives in 2024. This parable tells us in kind of a no-nonsense way that we need to get our priorities straight and get focused on that which matters most. It also tells us how it is that we need to go about it, thankfully. First of all, we have to know that God expects us to be fruitful. God expects us to be fruitful. He expects us to be productive, to bloom and produce fruit where it is that he has planted us. For three years, this tree produces no fruit, so the owner ordered it to be removed. A fig tree has one purpose, and one purpose only. Produce figs. (laughs) Right? If you're a fig tree, what's your job? figs. I'm in the fig business. It's what I do. I make them. No fig has to wake up in the morning and go, geez, what am I going to do today? Ah, I don't know. Mm. Gosh, so many options. I just wish I knew my purpose. Fig tree never has to say that. It's like, oh no, I need to get about the business of doing what it is that I need to do in order to produce fruit. Right? That's what it is that the fig is up to. This leads us to the second truth. And it's probably the best news that you're going to hear all day. The gardener is on your side. 
<laughs> Thank goodness. Because we sometimes be a little distracted. But the gardener is on your side. Other translations call him a caretaker. He's the one in charge of giving the plants in the garden what it is that they need in order to grow fruit. When the owner speaks of the, of the vineyard, to the, to the, to the, when the owner, or sorry, when the owner speaks of the vineyard, he says, chop the tree down. But this man, he steps up. He steps in. Right? He says, whoa, 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 whoa. Give another shot here. Sir, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Who, who in the parable does the gardener represent? Sorry. Nobody knows? Or it's like Sunday School 101. The teacher asks a question, and the answer is always the same. Who, do, just we'll try one more time for those of you who are, just forgot your Sunday school days. If you could just turn to somebody beside you and look them in the eyes. I see you. You're looking, who are you looking at? Don't look at me. No. Look to somebody around you. Who does the gardener represent? Jesus. I didn't, I, ah, thank you. That's great news. Because he's, he's working on our behalf. He is our advocate. Right? He's our helper. Uh, he's the gardener of our souls. And the great news is that he is constantly pruning away the things in our life that don't matter. He's constantly pruning away the things that are distractions from the main thing. He's, he's constantly investing in us, spending time with us, restoring us, doing something new in us. He's the gardener of our souls. And he wants to fill us with a grace, with the power to actually produce fruit for him. I love the image that this presents of Jesus. He, he's saying to the owner of the vineyard, in effect, you know, I'm going to look after it. I'm going to make this my special project. I'll dig around it. I'll give it the nurture and care that it needs. I'll give it every opportunity to grow. Just give it one more chance. See, Jesus is on your side. That's the good news. John says that we have an advocate working on our behalf. You know what that word advocate means? Right? It means lawyer. That we have a defender sitting on the right hand of the Father and he's constantly speaking about us, defending us to God. Thank goodness. Because there are lots of times where I have no defense. It's it. <laughs> The, the thing that we, we sometimes forget about, we, we talk about this word grace. That's what this means. It means he is working on our behalf even though we don't deserve it. It's crazy. He knows we're guilty. And yet he's defending us. It's grace where you get something you don't deserve. That's good news because our list of failures is long. Yours is long. Mine's pretty long, too. <laughs> long. But, ugh. but, we cannot miss the warning here, either. See, the Bible is clear. God the Father is not mocked. The owner is upset because the fig tree had the appearance of fruitfulness, but lacked the goods. It had taken on the name of fig tree, but didn't produce any figs. It, it looked good on the outside, but there was something not firing prop, properly. It looked good on the outside, but on, on the inside, something just wasn't working right. And as a result of that, it wasn't producing fruit. Okay, if you clicked off for a little while, it's time to just click back on. Okay? Can I gently from a, a, a loving pastoral heart, can I challenge you? God is not interested in deceivers who take on the name 
disciple of Jesus and are not producing disciples. There are these people and they take on the name Christian. But they're not following Jesus into the fruitfulness by partnering with him to make new Christians. God said you're going to know a disciple by its fruit. Sometimes Jesus followers, unfortunately, I think they fool themselves into forgetting that there will be two judgments at the end of days. Two judgments. Unbelievers, if you're an unbeliever, you get one judgment. It's really simple for you. Not easy, but it's simple. Someday, the, the Bible calls it the, the judgment of the white throne room where you're going to stand before God and you're going to get asked a question, did you believe in and know my son Jesus? And as a result, your name is rewritten into the book of life. Although it is simple, trust me, the answer had better be yes on that one. Did you know Jesus as Savior? The other judgment is... A separate judgment happens at a different time. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. Where the question is going to sound a little bit more like this. Did you make Jesus Lord of your life? Did you submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? Did you fight for unity in the, bottom, in the body of Christ? Which looks like laying down your needs and wants to serve others as Jesus served. Did you put Jesus' priorities ahead of your own in your life? Did you, did, see, we're going to have to give an account of how it is that we used our time, how it is that we used our energy, how it is that we used our money, all of which are gifts given to us by God. How did we leverage those for the things of Jesus? That's what making him Lord means. Where we don't do what it is that we want when it is that we want. Instead we go, God, what is it that you want? Basically, the question will be, did you live out the purpose and mission that I gave to you? Did you make disciples? The Bible tells us that this is not going to be pleasant if you were unfaithful, if you were unloving, if you were divisive, if you were unsubmissive, if you were unfruitful, 1 Corinthians 3 describes it as suffering great loss, much like walking through a curtain of fire. Just turn to somebody and go like this. See, we're going to be called in front of Jesus to give an account of our fruitfulness, our individual fruitfulness and our collective fruitfulness, where we where we have to talk about how we engaged with the last thing that Jesus said to us, how we engaged in the mission that he gave to us as an individual and as a church. Did you make disciples? Did you pass on faith and hope and love, which are the only things that will last for eternity? How did you share your faith with others? How did you share hope with others? How did you love others? This is the other judgment that we face as disciples. It is coming for each and every one of us, if you believe. Now let's get practical then. Will you just pull out your phone, or if you have a pen and paper, maybe that's totally fine too. Um, but this is going to be a really helpful exercise for you. Write down the names of the three people you are currently discipling. If you're just an unbeliever checking this out today and you're not sure where it is that you stand, this is not a big deal for you. You just get to sit and watch the other people around you sweat. Okay? 
So no pressure on you whatsoever. But if you call yourself a Jesus follower, write down the names of the three people that you are currently discipling. And then if you are a, a, a truly faithful disciple maker, will you write down the names of the three people that each of those three people are discipling as well? While you're writing, I want to thank those of you who did our survey. Uh, it was extremely helpful. Uh, I'm very grateful that you took the five minutes out of your time in order to do the survey. Um, if you didn't do it, it's because you're not checking your messages or you're not checking your emails or you're just lazy. Um, but we got a great cross section uh, from the church. I'm extremely grateful. Um, for those of you who want to know how it is that we fared, uh, we got 77%. No, no, we can't cheer for that. I know there's some of you who are like, oh, that's awesome. Like, I used to get like 60s. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and, and to be honest, 77% is actually better than we used to be. So we're tracking the right way, which is really cool. We scored like high 90s in some areas, and we scored low 70s in other areas. Um, but this was about us getting a gauge of where it is that the health of our church is at. Um, we're not content with 77%. Um, there are some things that we're going to work on in the days ahead, and there's more on that to come. Um, but there is one specific thing that just jumped out of, at me. Um, one thing, one, one glaring statistic that just kind of like hit me in the junk. If you're a guy, you know it was that bad. <laughs> it was bad. It hit me like a it hit me like a brick. And here's what it was. Um thirty five percent of believers at Connect Church are not making a single disciple. Thirty five percent, over a third. And so today, I'm leaving the 99 to go after the 35 <laughs> and to encourage you to change. See, the great news about this parable is that it actually, it, it actually is one of those write your own endings kind of parables. <laughs> It kind of ends on a cliffhanger, which I hate, but is actually an opportunity and an invitation to you to engage yourself into the story of what it is that happens next. You get to decide, am I going to one day stand before God and he's going to ask me, did you make disciples? And my answer will be, yes, yes. This one, this one, this one, and then they made this one and this one, and they made that one, that one, and that one. They made this one, these two, they just fell apart. But picked up another on the side over here, and then they made where we get to the work of the mission that God gave to us individually. We take ownership of it. Because the gardener's going to say, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. If someone wanted to become fruitful in the Christian life, what is it that you should do? How do you go about it? You, well, you do what Israel didn't do. It starts with repentance. I'm just going, you know what? I have been slacking off. Or, you know what? I have been putting it off. Or, you know what? I, I have been saying someday I'll get to that. Or, you know what? I just don't know what that means, and so I probably don't need to do it. But that's not going to be the right answer. It's time to make a shift. It's time to repent, the Bible talks about. 
and get to the work that God has created us for to do, to do. The good works that he planned in advance. When he was writing your name in the book of life, he said, I'm going to give them this ability and I'm going to give them this personality and I'm going to put in a little bit of this gifting and I'm going to gear things so that they're at the right place at the right time. And I'm going to put them in this spot because the people around them are desperately going to need to hear from what this person has. And he has placed you in the exact spot that you're supposed to be in so that you could hear this message today so that you would make a shift and get to the work of making of disciples. It's a daily attitude. We have to remember that repentance is a daily attitude that says, God, I want to turn away from the stupid choices that I made yesterday. And I want to live a life that is focused on what it is that you have called me to today. Thank you that I'm forgiven. And I get to live in the fullness of your grace, that I don't have to try to do this on my own. It's actually your power at work within me. Please, for ignoring the mission that you gave to me to make disciples, I'm going to change in 2024. I'm going to find somebody that I can mentor, somebody that I can pour into, somebody that I can spiritually parent. I'm going to become, I, I really feel like that is, each, I don't care how old you are, I don't, I don't care how, how new to faith you are, if you would just in 2024 actually accept the calling of being a spiritual parent to somebody. Some of you might be like, um, but I just gave my life to Jesus like last week. Guess what? You got one week's worth of wisdom and understanding that one other person desperately needs. Make sure you pass it on. Why? Because God has actually geared our minds in a way that we only, what it is that we hear, we lose 95% of. What it is that we read, we lose about 80% of. What it is that we engage with, we lose about 60% of. What it is that we teach to somebody else, we retain about 85% of it. So he's actually geared in us. If we want to keep the learning and understanding that we've been getting, what is it that we need to do? Teach it to somebody else. He's wired it into our brain that if we are faithful with little, we'll be given much. I'm going to become a spiritual parent because the father has been a good, good father to me. You know, our, our vision for 2024, some of you have seen this before, it's like the, we are, there are two rails that we are heading on this year that we are going all into. We're going to be passionate about raising healthy families. We're going to be passionate about raising healthy disciples. It's about multiplication. This isn't about addition. Some of us are like, yeah, but I added one. One plus one is addition. One times one is still one. Raising up healthy families. Raising up healthy disciples. Where it's really just a loving father saying, you are my child. And I am engaging with you. I'm spending time with you. I've invested in you. Will you love me so much that you'll invest in somebody else? See, sometimes we forget that the original commandment wasn't meant to be burdensome. It was when we were still in complete relationship with the Father, when he gave us the very first commandment. Go. Be fruitful. Multiply. It's not a toil. It's actually something that brings us life. It's something that brings us joy. It's something that brings us hope and excitement. It's what it is that you were created for. This is pre-fall. Be fruitful. Multiply. God is a good father. We are his beloved children. And this is our primary identity. Jesus came to bring us back into relationship with God so that we wouldn't just make our lives about ourselves, but we'd invest in something with eternal consequences. Because how the story ends is up to you. 
How the story ends, it ends on a cliffhanger because it's up to you. I was just so thankful for my boss who pulled me aside and lovingly did the work of confronting me, challenging me to be better, challenging me to produce. He helped me change. I, I eventually became a manager at Canadian Tire. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> People would write letters about me. Customers would come in and write letters. In fact, I made it onto the Canadian Tire Wall of Winners. Somewhere my name is on a plaque in Ontario. Wow. You may be surprised, but I'm actually not interested in that accolade. Very much. But I do desperately want to hear an accolade from my loving father at the end of my days where I'm going to stand before him and have an opportunity as he plays back the reel of my life. And I'm going to have an opportunity to see how my fruitfulness impacted the world. And you're going to have an opportunity to see how your fruitfulness impacted the world where I'm going to get to see how my greatest fruit was actually not my fruit, but the fruit that grew on somebody else's tree. Where I was a faithful disciple that made disciples, who also made disciples, who made disciples. And may I hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with little The church has to get back to its mission and multiply. God is pulling out the stops in 2024. We must get serious about multiplying disciples. Have to get serious about multiplying leaders. Have to get serious about multiplying ministers, about multiplying churches. We have to get back. 2024, it's one year. The great news is the gardener is on our side. He's going to be massaging in all sorts of goodness. But are you willing to get to the work of the Father? I believe this church is coming into a year of fruitfulness like it's never seen before. Where spiritual parents, those with the loving heart, heart of the Father, will actually step into the calling that God created for them. Will actually be intentional to engage in it on a daily basis. So a couple of things. First, a reminder. For 2024, create time and space for Jesus to do the work that he needs to by intentionally abiding in him. Daily, you spend time in prayer and he speaks to you. He invests in you. You spend time reading his word and he makes it come alive in you the way that it's never come alive before. You spend time with other believers, intentional time where you speak into their life and they speak into your life on a regular basis, where you spur one another on towards love and good works. You commit to this in a way that you haven't committed to before, where you actually abide and work out of a place of his lifeblood running through you. That I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me thing, abide that's the place you start. Second, be a disciple. Be a disciple. That means you actively follow Jesus. You actively allow him to become more like him as he refines you. And then you get to the work that he did. That's how we define discipleship at the church, becoming like Jesus. It's following Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. Be a disciple this year. And part of being a disciple means produce fruit, meaning make a disciple. In fact, you can't be a disciple unless you're making a disciple. You've missed the definition somewhere along the line. You'll know a disciple by their fruit. Get to the work that God gave you of making disciples. God is going to make this a church where disciples will come to be discipled into the fullness of Jesus. And we're gonna need a ton of people 
to get to work connecting with them, encouraging them, loving them, guiding them. You only need to be one step ahead of them, which will encourage you to actually get one more step ahead the next week. And then if you really want to begin to see God transform your life, then all of the things that you're learning pass on to somebody else and they will begin to root in your life in ways that they haven't rooted before because those who are faithful with little will be given much. Use your time wisely in 2024. Use your money wisely in 2024. Invest in things that matter. Use your giftings wisely in 2024. I'm out of time. Let's pray.